Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Welcome. And let us know that you can hear. Can you hear us all real good? No, that's good. It's pretty good acoustics here. I think we'll take a break. Tony, do we have an idea when we want to break during this time? Uh, what, the, 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 the 315? 315. Two hours? Okay. Yeah, that feels pretty good. Minutes, okay. Three yeah. or 315. Three or 315. Just let us know if we get to that point. You need to use a restroom or something. We'll yeah, I'm going to keep coffee coming here for those of you who might want a cup of coffee. I always need several of the <laughs> Okay. Yeah. It's nap time for me. Yeah. Well, this afternoon I think is going to be very practical because the sermon today opened up with this idea of undoing the self-concept. And that's a pretty advanced aspect of A Course in Miracles. That's why it, it doesn't really come out so clearly until chapter 31 out of 31. So you know that it takes a lot of preparation. And there's actually parts of A Course in Miracles where Jesus says that you need careful preparation because parts of the workbook will make a direct approach to God. And if you're not prepared for those direct approaches to God, then he says they will appear more traumatic than beatific. So that's the difference between preparing, studying the course, practicing the course, transferring the training, so that when you get to the workbook and you get into those later parts of the workbook where there's a, a, a direct approach to God, that you are ready for the beatific experience of yielding into that experience instead of the terror of, oh my God, my whole world is going to be wiped away. <laughs> you can see that's the difference between the, the, tra the trauma of the ego and its reaction to the direct approach to God and the beatific glory of, oh, my mind is ready to wake up and I'm ready to yield into that light. And I'm not afraid of the light anymore. I'm going to welcome the light. So that's, I would say, the best uh, impetus, the best sense of urgency of actually practicing the Course and actually transferring the training to prepare your mind for a direct approach, which is what the experience is about. Because Jesus tells us a universal theology is impossible, but a universal experience is really inevitable. That's where this is all heading. So some of you know from my life that, that for me, early on, it wasn't enough just to study the Course. I had to bring it in, I had to reach into an experience of, of deep prayer. Because I think, even though I was raised as a Christian, I, just, I still didn't know what prayer was. I think a lot of times, uh, for many Christians, prayer is just more asking, it's more supplication. God, will you do this for me? God, will you do this for me? And it's very common in Western prayer, but if some of you who have done Eastern meditation and open to Eastern ways, it's more of a receptivity and stillness of opening to listen, to hear, to be informed, to be inspired, to be taken deeper. And it's not to say that there is anything wrong with the supplication, in the sense that in the Song of Prayer, Jesus says, you know, you really, you can't pray beyond your own level of awareness. So if you are praying as a person in need, you can't help but ask for help with certain things, because that's how you perceive yourself. So there's nothing wrong with any way of praying, it's just that as you go deeper up the ladder, higher the ladder, then the more you start to approach more of receptivity, of just asking to be shown, or asking for experiences 
even things like asking for patience or asking for tolerance is a step above the supplication of, can you pay my bills for me? Can you, you know, the supplication that most of us are used to of asking God for. Can you give me favor? I'm dating this person. Can you give me a little favor, God? Those are the typical <coughs> supplication prayers. So, Lisa has joined me today. Mm. She's come all the way from Utah. And, and Lisa coming along also brings a lot of experiences in this dismantling that I mentioned earlier in the sermon about like the I Heart Huckabees, dismantling of everything that you believe you are. And Lisa has gone through a lot of dismantling experiences, mm. gone through a lot of darkness arising, fear and doubt, and therefore is capable of witnessing mm. and using a lot of the experiences that she went through in, as a way of witnessing and sharing with all of you that it may help you all the more. Because as we're undoing the ego, it helps to have examples. It helps to have actual demonstrations. Even in 12-step programs, that's why people go for support. They want to hear how it was, what happened, and how it is now. They, they need to hear those witnesses. People are much more linked in to just listening to somebody directly expressing from their experience, not a bunch of theories, not a bunch of formulas, not a bunch of hypotheticals, but actually what is it about your experience that has changed and how can it benefit me? That's what people want to know. So there's lots of parallels. And in one sense that's the way that Lisa and I have been used a number of times on our travels is you know, we may talk about what the Course is asking of us, but then we also will talk about what our actual experiences were in stepping through it because of the value of that. Maybe you mm -hmm. want to just mm -hmm. share and introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, I'm Lisa, and I feel really grateful to be here and just be able to talk about, yeah, just my journey, even my relationship with the Course of Miracles, my relationship with the Holy Spirit. And also then my relationship with David in that, how he kind of showed up on my journey. But, yeah, when I got the Course in Miracles, it was you know, about 20 years ago. And it was part of, yeah, you know, I was in a real, real dark place. I was very depressed for most of my life. 35 years, I would say, chronically depressed. Uh, just was trying to go to therapist and psychologist, I was trying everything in the world, money, success, relationships, drugs, alcohol, anything that I could do to get happy. And yeah, The Course of Miracles came to me, actually the first time I heard The Course of Miracles was through Marianne Williamson on Oprah back in like 1996. And um, yeah, it was the first time I actually heard uh, anyone talk about God in a way that was loving and non-judgmental, and 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 it was like some kind of spark that I I started to listen to to see God in a whole new way, totally different than I perceived Him before, because I was actually uh, raised like in Lancaster County, where the Amish are, and Mennonites, and very conservative Christian. So my path was really, yeah, I was pretty wild. And so I was considered like one of those worthless sinners that was going to hell for sure. And uh, so God was never an option for me. So when the Course came along, it was a whole new way for me to really experience God or experience that I could have a relationship with God. So actually, the Course didn't actually take hold until... I had this experience where I was very suicidal, and I had a light experience at that time. And during this light experience, um, I actually went into some kind of, yeah, these words started coming out of this light. And they said, Lisa, 
Lisa, Lisa, you must truly believe. You must truly believe. And at that time, of course, miracles was in my house, but I couldn't read it. But this, this experience for me when I had this light experience was so profound because I knew at that moment I was so desperate, you know, to get out of this hell because I had a lot of traumatic experiences, you know, up until that time. But I knew for a fact at that point that I did, uh, it was the only thing that was left for me to believe in was God. There was nothing actually left for me to believe in in this world. And so I, yeah, I actually picked up the Course of Miracles and, and it was like I opened it up and it was like birds just started tweeting. <laughs> like it was like tweet, 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 tweet. <laughs> Truly, it was like this, after this mystical experience, it was like I just started reading it, and I actually shut out my whole world that I had been living before that time. You were talking about wit. It was like I died to myself. I actually did die that night, I felt. I totally died, and I realized that I needed to do something completely different in my life. And so um, it seemed traumatic, actually, at that point. And so I, I actually opened up the Course in Miracles, and I completely devoted my life at that time to that. And actually, this really humbling, because now I can sit here and tell you, I didn't realize how much that, how, how far Jesus was calling me to be devoted. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> you know, um, so A Course in Miracles became like my, my, my life. It was like, I just, I, it was like Jesus just started talking to me through A Course in Miracles, every single day telling me what to do and really developing for me it was more about the joy I wanted joy and I wanted to be happy and 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 also laughter that Jesus said that that you know that heaven is remembered by happy laughter and and he kind of sold me at that I thought, okay. so it's been it's been quite a journey um, that was like 20 years ago and uh, yeah, just, I don't know where I want to go with that, but, but yeah, just very, very deep, deep journey, developing this relationship with the Holy Spirit. Because what I actually saw was my mind, when, when I got the course, no one ever told me to look at my thoughts. No one ever said, pay attention to what you're thinking. And when I really, really started to look at my mind at that time, I saw that my mind was possessed with guilt and shame and unworthiness, and, and I was in prison. Actually, I was so depressed at that time, I couldn't even go outside of my house. I was one of those people that you see when you drive by their house where the yard is all grown up and the, and the trash is all outside. That was, that was who I was. I couldn't get out of my house. I had so much shame and so much guilt, and I was in a prison. And so when I started studying the Course, he said that it was my thoughts alone that were causing me this pain. And that, you know, that I, Jesus started working with me with developing this relationship with the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, and, and paying attention to the way that I felt became like a way that I started letting go of logic and started really, really nurturing that intuitive feeling of paying attention to how I felt. And so it was this developing, really, the relationship with the Holy Spirit. It started out just, you know, very, very pure. I mean, I, I actually, I didn't even know anything about mind training, and that's one of the things that I have to say, just the unbelievable power of mind training is, is this, our mind is very, 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 very powerful, and that, uh, you know, an untrained mind can accomplish nothing. And so part of this journey was really, really starting to pay attention. You know, it's beyond even mindfulness. It's about, you know, the Holy Spirit. And for me, you know, I, I, I knew that whatever I was reading in this Course in Miracles was the most important thing that I had ever read in my whole life. I just felt like this I needed to really pay attention to. And, uh, yeah, and so I needed to really, really focus. And so what I started doing uh, in my journey 
and I shared this a lot with people, but I started, uh, well, and I, and I didn't know anything about the Bible. I didn't know anything about Jesus or anything, but a friend of mine started showing up at that time who was a Christian, and I was telling her some of the things I was reading in the course, and she would say, oh my word, this is exactly what Jesus is saying in the Bible. This is the, this is the deepest teachings of what Jesus was saying. And so me and her kind of, she was kind of reflecting to me that whatever I was reading was coming from Jesus. So one of the things that I started to do in the very, very beginning was I actually started uh, using a mustard seed. I would have, you know, the faith of a mustard seed. So I actually used to put this mustard seed on my tongue. So this mustard seed became my relationship with the Holy Spirit. I used to have this mustard seed because it was if I had the faith of a mustard seed, you know, and that I could remember. I needed to remember and to pay attention to what I was thinking and what I was doing because my mind was so entrained and so, I would say, possessed, you know, by the ego at that time. And so it was this development of really, really getting focused. And I love what Jesus said because uh, he said that the, the, the Holy Spirit is always present. It's always here, present, right now. He's never not with us. He's always here. And that I needed to remember. <laughs> All I needed to do was remember that I had help and support. And so this mustard seed became my, my lifeline, you know, with the Holy Spirit to ask and to start you know, unwinding my mind back to God, actually. Removing the blocks, the awareness of love's presence in my own mind. And so it was, yeah, it's a, it, it seems like it's, I'm right here right now, but it's the most amazing journey. And, and at that very beginning time, um, you know, the, Jesus was having me go through all kinds of undoing. Really, really looking at my attack thoughts. And seeing how I was living in a dream, I couldn't believe that I was living in a dream. And actually, it was a nightmare. Because <laughs> up until that point, there were a lot of things that seemed to have happened in my journey. And uh, yeah, one of them was a, a lot of tra traumatic stuff. I had a sister who had uh, been uh, murdered and raped, and, and she had been missing for eight years. And it, it kind of broke up my whole family. Uh, completely destroyed everyone. The whole family unit was kind of destroyed at the time. And I felt very, very alone and very, very, you know, I was a victim of the world, for sure. And, and I was having victim experiences over and over again and feeling very separate and alone. And, and I couldn't believe that there was a possibility, actually, that I had been dreaming. <laughs> really? Like that there was a possibility that this really didn't actually occur. Like, you know, it was actually a profound, something very profound to me that I was just, you know, replaying memories. These were just memories in my mind. And one thing was for sure, and I could see it in the presence, it wasn't happening anymore. It was not here. It was in the past. And that I had the power to forgive it. And that I had the power to see that I could undo and let go of my addiction. And that's what I saw. I had an addiction to a concept of being a victim. <laughs> I was a victim. And I was having victim experiences after victim experiences after victim experiences. And all I did was talk about my victim experiences. <laughs> you know, that's all I did. And so I, like, solidified it all the time. I was a victim. But that I had the power, I couldn't believe it. It was a miracle. I thought, oh, my God, that I have the power to, to and, and Jesus was saying, you are the holy son of God in whom I am well pleased. And that you... You are addicted to this experience, actually, of weakness and littleness. And, and, and you know, you, you're, you're addicted to that, to being separate. And that he said, I'm going to open your mind 
basically, if you would give me your mind, then I'm going to open your mind to another experience. Another experience that's of innocence and of perfection and holiness. If I could just pay attention and listen and open my mind to something completely different, to another experience, to see that there was something more valuable. That, you know, I was seeing what was valueless and value, valuable, actually, and seeing how I was attracted to that. I was attracted to being that. And how really that's how humbling this journey is, is we are, we're, we're addicted to that, playing weak and frail and small and separate. And so I saw that I had, I had some work to do. I had a lot of work to do. I had to, I had to really, really start paying attention to see how I was doing this to myself. And then that was powerful. I couldn't believe that. I couldn't believe that I, had, that I was responsible for my happiness. And when I found that I was responsible and, 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 and I was not a victim of the world, that was really empowering for me. I thought, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this decision. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really pay attention to this, that it's possible that I could be happy all the time and that I had, could have no worries. And that it was possible that I could develop this relationship with God, which was really developing my relationship with my innocence at that time is, is really what it was all about. To really open up, to really not just talk about that. You know, words are good. Like, like Jesus even says in the Course, these are like really good ideas. Mm-hmm. Unless you accept them. They're just like fantasies. They're just fantasies. You just talk about them. But this is really about opening our mind up you know, in the mind training to see how we're, you know, constantly denying that. Constantly denying that. So anyhow, <clears throat> it started out this process of me, uh, yeah, just developing this relationship with God and the Holy Spirit. And, and one of the things that Jesus was calling me to do was, because I was a nurse at the time, and uh, I, I actually... Was, was working as a nurse. And when Jesus said that I was a healer, when I read that in the course that I was a healer, I thought, I am a healer, but I'm not a healer of the body. I never really thought that I actually was accomplishing any healing. But he's, he was going to take me on another journey, and it was about healing myself. You know, physician, heal thyself. And so through these, uh, the, the course of, of this journey... I ended up starting my own company. It was, it was called Abundant Nursing. And when I met David, I was living in Mount Joy, Pennsylvania, or the, the company was in Mount Joy, Pennsylvania. He was like, the Spirit was sending me all these symbols, just developing this relationship with the Holy Spirit. And yeah, and so I ended up yeah, owning a company, and it became very, very successful. And I was like the president of that company. And, um, yeah, and, and the, whole, the whole part of that whole business was about me developing this relationship with the Holy Spirit. It wasn't about the business. I always said it was, a, it was like, a, a, just a, like a fake business, and it was my temple, where I was really, really, really using it as this opportunity to look at all of my own judgments in my own mind. To really, really see how much judgment I had in my own mind, and there were tons of it. So, so part of the, this company was a staffing company, and I had the joy of interviewing like ten nurses a day. Was part of my, you know, hiring nurses was part of the whole thing. And so each one of them became my 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 savior. My brother became my savior as, as this business was was all happening, like I was really, I had my mustard seed on my tongue, and, and I was bringing them in and just using it all as this backdrop, just to heal my mind. And yeah, and, and actually what ended up happening was the business became very successful, and I ended up 
actually, un, uh, I didn't have to work anymore. Actually, what was which was amazing to me because I was a single mom for that, and I've been struggling for years. But I ended up I didn't have to work. Well, that just actually gave me more time to study. I, I was in love with with uh, the study and 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 the practice and. And just seeing the power of my mind and seeing that I was starting to, you know, heal. Like, truly, truly heal. But, yeah, until I met David. <laughs> <laughs> then the healing really started, is what I, I feel. Yeah, I think it's part of what Helen first heard from Jesus was it was called it's a celestial speed-up. Mm-hmm. People were being called from all over to take their part in a celestial speed-up. So I think what we'll be talking about this afternoon, and, and using parables from Lisa's life, from the parable of David, parable of Lisa, is we're going to present a picture and a witness of, of really the full extent of where this course is leading. Because mm-hmm. it's tempting to start reading this book and feel your heart opening up to feel uplifted and everything, but the temptation of this world is to try to bring the light into the darkness, Mm -hmm. to try to have a better life, to use the Course to have a better life. And what I mean by a better life is is a better linear life, denying that life is heaven, the life life is eternal, life is being with God, that's what life is. In fact, I read that passage that Lisa read this morning during the sermon, and it's the passage that I gave that where everyone who comes is trying to solve the riddle of their of their life. And we think of the world as being born and living and dying, and Jesus calls that a riddle. Everything we consider so important in this world that's part of the life of the body, Jesus says, no, the body is the hero of the dream. You know, every dream has its central figure as the hero, and the hero seems to be born and struggle and strive and die. And actually that's the riddle. So the mind, when it falls asleep and forgets heaven, when it forgets nirvana, it's caught up in a riddle of a world. It's a hypothetical world actually, as if the separation had occurred. So this is an entire hypothetical as if construct. And it's a dream, but it's been forgotten that it's a dream. In fact, there's even one point of the Course where, pretty late in the text, where Jesus says, awareness of dreaming is the function of God's teachers. You've heard of lucid dreaming. You know, you're, you're asked not to occasionally have maybe a lucid dream at night, but actually to come to a conscious state of like, hmm, this is a dream. <laughs> you know, you could, you could laugh at dragons and, and you could laugh at being fired from jobs, and you could laugh even at, at sickness and death if you were aware that you were dreaming. But when you're not aware that you're dreaming, these projections become quite serious because to a mind that's asleep, these seem to be very extremely serious things. You know, going unconscious. Steve was telling me his, some of his story today after the service. You know, that seems to be a big deal, going unconscious, you know, that's like a major deal when somebody goes unconscious, but but it was very much a part of the parable of Steve and the the healing. Mm -hmm. So, what we're going to present is is a context for me of having gone like maybe between three to five years of deep immersion into the Course and going into, oh my God, I can see what this is really calling me to. This is calling me to laying aside all concepts, all self-concepts. And that part that I mentioned that I felt was so important, you will make many concepts of the self as learning goes along. That's just that the Holy Spirit is, you know, the mind couldn't handle just going into abstraction and going directly into light. It would be too terrifying. It would seem like the ultimate loss. And Jesus says, don't be afraid, you won't be hurled into reality, he says, we are going to get a series of concepts that will seem like each one, there's a bit of loosening in the mind, there's a bit more lightness, there's a bit more not taking things so seriously. There's still concepts. You still will be using terms of time and space, you still will 
have things that you seem to still be going through as a person. They're still personal concepts, but they're also very helpful. Each one is going to be a little bit lighter and a little looser. Mm. And they're all taking you up towards the atonement, towards that place of forgiveness, which is a very high, high, high state of mind. It's the highest goal that we can go for in this awakening. It has anything to do with perception, accepting the atonement, the happy dream, the healed world, the forgiven world, true perception, those are all different synonyms for where this is going. So, the main principle that's underneath what we're going to talk about today is what Jesus repeats over and over and over and over in A Course in Miracles, that you cannot bring the truth into the illusion. You, to heal, you must bring the illusion to the truth. And what does that mean? You must bring the illusions in your mind. Like, like Roxy talked about the beliefs. You have to bring the beliefs, every single belief that you hold. To learn this course requires willingness to question everything that you believe. Not one can be hidden or it will obscure your learning. The main thing to always remember is, I will only wake up to heaven, to nirvana, to oneness, through bringing illusions to the truth. And the temptation is to spiritualize matter. The temptation is to even bring high sounding lofty words in and think that you're going to convince your neighbor, <laughs> convince your, your mother or father, your children, the people around you about these lofty words. This is not about trying to convince anyone. In fact, if you notice yourself feeling like an insistence to convince somebody, the question would be, who are you convincing? Who are you trying to convince? That would be just another example of trying to bring the truth into the illusion. So our parables are going to be used by the Holy Spirit as a way of showing the direction of when you keep bringing the illusion to the truth, when you keep offering these beliefs up, you will start to experience lots of miracles. Not just a miracle here or there, but as you continue to bring the illusions to truth, you will be flooded, your mind, your consciousness will be flooded with miracles. You will become habitually miracle minded. And then you will have lots of, we'll say, synchronicities, lots of, wow, that's amazing, mm -hmm. uh, like answers to your prayers, but just appear instantly and you have such a sense of humbleness and a sense of respect because they're so convincing when they just start showing up. Now, just to start it off too, I can give some examples. I'm going to use a couple, uh, America, we're here in San Francisco, and we go back into American history. Let's, go, let's use some presidents, for example. Abraham Lincoln is a very interesting example as a president. Abraham Lincoln said, A mind changed against its will is of the same opinion still. A mind changed against its will. Jesus is asking us to change our mind, and here's the the president that was responsible for freeing the slaves. We were talking about it's Harvey, Harvey Milk's birthday today and mm -hmm. the things in San Francisco history. But let's just look at Abraham Lincoln for a minute. You know, a, a, a very sincere, tall man with a, wore a top hat with a big beard, but he was from Illinois. And, and here's an example of someone who, over the course of his presidency, was faced with civil war, was faced with slavery, was faced with a lot of key, huge, huge issues of the time, and yet the Holy Spirit was just in the mind saying, hang with me here, Abraham. Interesting name, Abraham. <laughs> hang with me, Abraham, because we're going to go through a transformation. And I think of all the presidents I think of, when I think of prayer, Abraham Lincoln did a lot of praying. Imagine having a self-concept as the President of the United States and resorting to prayer. You don't find that, you won't, if you go back through the decades, you won't find that very often. A President talking about all the prayer 
all the prayer and time. And I'm throw another president out that comes to mind, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Imagine your self-concept as you're the president of the United States. You can't walk. You can't even walk in human form. And an event occurs called Pearl Harbor, where suddenly you're playing with your stamp collection and you're, you know, you know, you know, you're doing what you like to do as a president. You, know, you make these heavy decisions, but he's like, he's doing his stamp meditation one day and it's like, Mr. President, uh, Pearl Harbor, our, our Pacific fleet has been hit. How, what do you mean hit? Well, it's basically all been sunk. Basically, we've got sailors trapped in capsized ships and suffocating to get to death. And you know, you know that that puts a, a, a pause in your stamp collecting meditation. Uh, you know, when you're there, and and this was this was just an event. Again, an event in time and space. But as far as history goes, that's that there's some forgiveness opportunities because. He had a, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, you know, was a, was a very wonderful wife. She was very deep, very spiritual, very supportive and everything. It really, I think that time it took her being there with him <laughs> to help him loosen that self-concept because, you know, he ended up, as, we, as the United States went into World War II, and he ended up having to have braces built and learn to be able just to stand and walk with great struggle just to represent a symbol of strength. Mm -hmm. You know, he went through an enormous thing. Now this is a course in mind training. And so we are asked, as Lisa was saying, that we can only be hurt by our thoughts, but we have to think with a new thought system to be free. We have to so thoroughly release and escape this old thought system of victimization, of lack, of attack, of suffering, of betrayal, of abandonment. We have to th so thoroughly be purified, be free of this in order to come to the atonement or the real world. In the parable of David, it seemed to be a very slowly evolving curriculum that started to get activated like in around 1985 and there was uh, a lot of time alone, a lot of prayer, meditations, and then eventually studying the Course and, and going on to extreme, we might say, radical guidances from Jesus in order to loosen my mind from the self-concept of being shy, of being uh, just another person in the world trying to pay off debts, you know, work my way through life, dealing with the relationship issues, dealing with health issues, dealing with maybe not clinical depression, but a sense of like low-grade depression, of just the depression of the existential depression of the human race, <laughs> of being a human being trying to make it through, you know, that was true. But with my slow progression, it was more slow, incremental, steady over many, many years and even began before 1985, and with Lisa's examples, which are going to kind of be more rock your world examples. It would be more like, with a lot of Lisa's examples, it's as if she decided to have like seven lifetimes played out in one. And the only say, reason I mention that is for all of us, this will be extreme teaching examples. There have been times as I was going very slowly, steadily, like the turtle and the hare, I was going through my slow, steady, incremental miracles. Help! What? <laughs> okay, I was going through step by step. What happened by the time I met Lisa was that I had gone through such a transformation of consciousness, of releasing beliefs and self-concepts. I had transcended the idea of, of working for a living, of having a career, of all kinds of things that seem to be very basic kind of things that human beings believe in to survive. I had transcended all of that by the time I met Lisa. 
to the point where I was like Johnny Appleseed, I'm out on the road, I'm traveling, I'm speaking, I'm living in divine providence, I'm living on donations, very, very simple, very spontaneous. And then uh, I did, I was very transparent, I love how Tony's so transparent with everything with the church, he put it all out. I put my cell phone on the internet <laughs> and, and Lisa called it. And uh, so I'm out traveling, I think between some of my gatherings somewhere, and the phone rings and I, I answer the phone, I say, hello. And it wasn't, hi, how, how are you, it didn't announce a name, it didn't have any kind of greeting or whatever. All it had was, I said, hello, and I heard, I want joy. That's all it said <laughs> at the other end. Very, see how direct that is. That's why she compressed seven lifetimes into one because I wasn't messing around. I, she wasn't messing around. I want joy, she says. I said, good, I, I can join you completely in that. And then of course the Holy Spirit initiates for me. I said, oh, I'm actually coming up to where you live and uh, near Harrisburg. But the very next week. Very next week. Uh, and she's like, oh, and I want joy. Oh. Oh, and then I said, actually, we could, if you want, we could have dinner before the uh, gathering. N no, no, no. It's like, she, I want joy by the end. She's not going to, it was a retreat. Well, no, I, was like, you know, I never did anything like this before, really. I was, I was studying the course by myself. I had gone to conference, and, and I actually traveled a little bit with uh, Mary Ann before him, but I was very, I was closed off in my own little world. And so when I, I, it was a miracle that I found him, but it was funny. I couldn't believe it says, call me anytime. Here's my number. <laughs> Put your cell phone number on, <laughs> on the internet. <laughs> For real, dude, you know. This was the early days of the internet. And then when I said, you know, then he said, how about we have dinner before the gathering? That's how I heard it, right? Like, who do you think you are? <laughs> <laughs> you know, who is this guy? She calls without announcing her name, and then when I say, let's have dinner. <laughs> I no, I don't think so. I don't think so. I'll see you at the gatherings. Okay. So thus began. So thus began a very open connection. But see, I have had already transcended. You might say I had the learning of the self concept had shifted so much for me that I was more kind of a a, a mix between like Peace Pilgrim and Saint Francis. Uh, <laughs> It, that was kind of a, my blend of self-concept at the time. And she was the CEO of a nursing staffing company. And so, you know, the CEO uh, self-concept. You think you've got some control, you know, people work for you and you pay the bills and you leave when you want to leave and do what you want to do because you're the CEO of the company. But it was worse than that. She actually was, she was a CEO who had had so many manifesting, you know, you talk about the secret and you can manifest, yeah. use the power of your well, mind. This is before the secret actually. Yeah, before the secret. She was not only a C CEO, she not only manifested going from, from pregnant and barefoot and being a waitress mm. uh, in, in a diner to manifesting being the CEO of a very large staffing company that had written God into the bylaws mm. and it was, it was exploding so fast that it grew with an, an enormous rate. So she had manifested from being pregnant and barefoot and on food stamps, she had manifested with the power of her mind, CEO of a very successful company. And then, but she had also a girlfriend that was working with her and the girlfriend watched her as she got more into the course and everything, and the manifesting, manifest things left and right. Mm. She, her house went from a dump with like grass that was two feet high, mm. and it was falling, gutters falling, you know, just a terrible state to, it was all remodeled, and it would look like a really nice house now, and then she had a, a god room, a whole room dedicated with, I, when I went in there eventually, all these objects that were just symbols of God loves you. So she had manifested that, she'd man but she'd actually gone a little bit over to the point that, that her and her friend actually believed they were specially chosen with a special gift from God to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. Mm -hmm. It had gone beyond just being a successful CEO and company, but they actually, when I met her, she believed 
that her, her and her girlfriend believed she had a special power. And she, I, we did. I and did. those two... I didn't know what was going on. Those two would bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. Now I use that as an example because what does the Course teach? You can't bring the truth into the illusion. Even when we use that kingdom of heaven on earth thing, we got to really see that it's a change in perception, you know, where heaven, heaven and earth are not existing as separate states, is what the Course says. But see how careful, how tricky that is. So, when I came in, it kind of like took the, the wind out of all that. It, the, the balloon was just puffing bigger and bigger and bigger, and then suddenly I come and meet her, and she says, I really think we're going to bring the kingdom of heaven and earth. I said, no. It's not going to happen. <laughs> and at that point... And he actually told me the word. I never actually heard it before, because the secret wasn't out or anything. And he said, oh, you're ma this is manifesting, or something like that. I never even heard of that. She was manifesting without knowing what a, a I didn't word even for. know that I was doing that. I, well, whatever was happening was just happening. But it was like, yeah, I would just pray and act like I received kind of thing. Yeah. So I did, I actually, people were like coming around me because they saw this big transformation. And it was, I'd say it's all this Course in Miracle book that I'm reading. <laughs> They're like, I, and so people were grabbing the Course in Miracles all around me. Oh, yay! <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> And again, we tell these parables because in, in this world, I mean, you look how Tony's church has grown over the decades, since what we said, 85, 87. It's, it's been a beautiful story of how it's grown, it's continued, the conferences and so on and so forth. What Lisa was doing is she, was, she written, wrote God into the bylaws, uh, and the more that her business grew and grew and grew and grew, with God and the bylaws and so on and so forth, that she actually had nurses that were coming there and when they would have downtime, she would actually have them reading the course in a business during downtime and watching videos, Course in Miracles videos. So there was a lot the Spirit was using in a very, very helpful way. But what I'm saying is it wasn't anything special that her business was growing, it, because remember it's a dream and there's nothing valuable in this dream at all in the Ottoman sense. Only symbols that help strengthen your awareness of the presence of God's love. And we know that's what happens in our life with relationships, with jobs and everything. They can come and then they can go and they're gone. So she actually had that point where she was, Holy Spirit was using it in such a devoted way and it seemed like a special gift and yet at that point, she couldn't really see a lot of things. There was like these huge pockets of darkness mm. and guilt and shame that were, were still out of awareness because things were going pretty good. Mm. And these were like real dark pockets of shame. And, and they involved your children. Mm. And they involved the, that belief that, that you could actually make something happen and make a difference in the world and make the world a better place, you know, like Michael Jackson's song, Heal the World, Make It a Better All of that was covering up a lot of darkness. And so I think that the more that we came together and we started relating, and the more we would go on travels together, mm. and the more we had that t close, intimate time to, to talk everything through in a very careful way, it was on, I know, Tony, you guys like the Socratic method, like, let's, let's let every, we want to hear from everybody, let's really have input. Well, we had plenty of time to let all the things come up, and yet, as great as all that seemed to be, I would say to her at times, I said, you know, there's going to come a time when you're going to sell this, and you're going to just let it all go, and you, I think at the time, what was your words? Were you crazy? <laughs> she, all she could see was the how how great everything was going. Was like, are you kidding? Are you this kidding? Is like the best thing that ever happened. I didn't have to work, and this money was coming in. This is a big. He said, "Oh, you're going to sell this thing. This is going to all, this is all going to disappear." And I'm like, "That's impossible." <laughs> yeah, there was there, there was so much to come that she couldn't see. Now, just imagine yourself, for example. We're talking about exchanging self concepts. Imagine that Lisa had gone through prostitution, being mm. a prostitute. She'd gone through being an, a mother who abandoned her children. Mm. She'd gone through obesity. Mm. She'd gone through being on drugs. Mm. She'd gone through clinical depression. 
oh, you better believe it's an improvement of the self-concept <laughs> to be the CEO of a company with I God in really your life. <laughs> she was cruising along and it seemed like a 360 turnaround from barefoot and pregnant and food stamps and, and obese in a and, and living I in a motel room. I lived in a motel room, walked yeah. six miles to the bar to work uh, while I was pregnant. And yeah, it was like this intense, all alone, just like living in this hotel room, not even knowing where, you know, I was going to, yeah, even where I was going to have a place for the baby. And you, some of you remember the, the Richard Gere movie, Pretty Woman, <laughs> with Julia Roberts? Mm -hmm. This guy walks into her restaurant, diner. diner. She diner. works at a diner, and he's a millionaire, and he marries her. <laughs> She's, you talk about pretty woman with <laughs> Julia Roberts. She's like pregnant, she's a restaurant, she's a waitress at a restaurant living in a, 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 some kind of dive. Well, right, I was, motel. right, well, when I was pregnant with my daughter, I lived in a motel, but once I had my daughter, I lived in this, yeah, you know, rat hole yeah. somewhere, but this guy showed up. Yeah, so, Mary's the millionaire, and some of you have heard like when people who win the lottery, you know, their, their, their form changes when they win the lottery. But the old, same old patterns are there. So she marries the millionaire, and then still the addictions continue, the, mm. the struggles around obesity, around, around depression, you know, mm. a lot of that. Marrying a millionaire, people would go, wow, hit the jackpot big time marrying a millionaire in that condition. That's a major self-concept leap, and yet those underlying things, addictions, were still there. And that's where it got more extreme because she, when I met her, she was telling me that story where she would like, her husband would buy her a diamond ring mm. and would slip the diamond ring onto her finger. And she was in such a state that she would just keep holding it out there. He would have to buy two diamond rings <laughs> and slip a double <laughs> on there to get a rise out of her. One wasn't enough. You see, there's a, there are some things going on under the surface there that going from poverty into great wealth, that didn't change the underlying content. There was still a lot there. And so it became more and more, as we kept going deeper and deeper and deeper in this, that I was more like not only Peace Pilgrim and St. Francis wound together, but I started, it was more like I was channeling Jesus. like. Leave all behind. Leave your children behind. Sell all that you have and give to the poor. Join with me and come into the kingdom of heaven. So it was really more Jesus as well coming in, as well as the traveling peace pilgrim and the and Saint Francis. It was coming in. And for Lisa, who had had all these experiences rolled into one, she was just willing to say, "I'm going to hang and go with this." But but there were many, many difficult challenges. Like, even though she was the CEO of a company, she still had deep unworthiness that was underneath, even though she was a CEO. That one of the people that worked for her actually <coughs> was a dev who came in, and dev bought you, was it a, a bed? Oh yeah. She went into Lisa's house and she bought her this beautiful bed, said, we're going to get you in, into a decent bed, because she could hardly even accept raises. You know, there was still an unworthiness, even though every little step was happening with the company, she still was feeling unworthy. It didn't, wasn't it Deb that washed your... Bonnie. Bonnie? Mm -hmm. her, her friend Bonnie washed mm -hmm. your feet. Mm -hmm. It was like washing the feet. There was all this deep unworthiness. Just because the form had changed dramatically, the mind was still feeling very, very unworthy. Yeah, and I feel like that's what Jesus really was doing with that business for me. It wasn't about the money. It was just healing a lot of deep stuff for me. Like because you know, I was actually afraid of money when we first when I first got the company. So I kind of blocked it out and I gave the responsibility to watching the money to someone else. Because I had had such a bad history with money. So I said I'm not even gonna look at the money, you know, at all. Like I blocked it out. I thought I'm not supposed to go there because of my past with money. And at one point, uh, Deb came to me and she said, listen, we're making a lot of money here. And then the account called and said, you know, we're going to have to raise your pay. 
Mm -hmm. We're going to actually have to raise it really, really high because it's not looking good on the books. And, uh, yeah, and so it was traumatic for me, actually, because I wasn't doing anything. I didn't feel like I was doing anything, and I had, it was the less I ever worked in my life, and all of a sudden I was making all this money, and, and, and the account said, I'm going to have to, we're going to have to do this legally. And I just really had a huge breakdown, just, yeah, just really deep breakdown because of why is this happening? Why, am I, why is this happening to me? And, I, and, and um, my friend at the time, you know, when I was having this big breakdown, she actually said, I have to do something right now. And she actually went and got a bucket. And she said, I want to wash your feet. She said, I want to just wash your feet and, like, wash this whatever was going on for me, because I just really was having a hard time accepting this, because I was actually giving my money away then at one point, you know, you remember that. Yeah, see, the thing was, a lot of times people, when you don't have money and then you come into money, money in this world, we call it philanthropy, philanthropy has a real good image in this world. Mm -hmm. Even yeah. though if you go to the characteristics of the teacher of God, Jesus will say that true giving and giving as the world knows giving are not the same thing. That the true, he goes into when, when you give a possession away, you divide its ownership. When you give the miracle away, it's a blessing for the giver and the receiver. So we think of Carnegie's and Bill Gates and, and these different philanthropists as givers. No, those are not, Jesus Christ would say, those are not examples of giving. Because True giving is the direct opposite, actually, the direct opposite of what giving is in the world. So what she was doing when I first met her was she would, she would give wads of money. People say, why didn't I know you, Lisa, at these days? Why wasn't I a part of your dream that day? She would give wads of money away, particularly at holidays, like Christmas. You'd get a wad. Children would get wads, friends. <laughs> would get wads, friends of children, you know, wads of money, except this went on year after year after year, and when she would not give the wads, they would go, where's my money? They had become addicted <laughs> to receiving money. And, and she did... The best place to go at Christmas. The yeah. best place to go is be around Lisa at Christmas, because these wads would come out. So when she started talking with me, and I would hear what she was doing, I was saying, wow, you're really giving out of guilt. You've got a lot of guilt and unworthiness, and before you didn't have the money, but now, with all this extra money, you're giving money out of guilt. And it's the motive by which you give that's the most important thing, because that's where your heart is. And if you can't tell the difference, if you think people around you are going, you are such a generous person, and you feel terrible, you feel you're trying to give it away to, to break out of this sense of unworthiness, and it's not working. So basically, what we had was a situation where she was giving money out of guilt, and also, uh, I was mentioning at the, the dinner we had last night, you know, with Kelly and Tony, what's it? She was in this position where the children, the teenagers, were in charge of the house. They were the ones that had all the power. When I first met her, mm -hmm. uh, the teenagers ran the house. Lisa went to work. And she earned the money, and she came home, she picked up all the clothes, <laughs> she cooked all the meals, she did all the cleaning. It was the super mom mm -hmm. syndrome. And what was under super mom? Guilt. guilt. More guilt. Mm -hmm. She was giving money away out of guilt, she was picking up teenagers' clothes, cooking all the meals, and this and this. And I said, well, this is where we need a mind overhaul. This is where we have to get in there and we have to turn everything around, like Byron Katie says. It was, it, it was a mess, but it had, it had improved so greatly. Remember, all these lifetimes, it improved so greatly from what it was, but it still had all this darkness that was underneath it, that was driving it. And that was good. These are great extreme teaching examples, just like the crucifixion was an extreme teaching example these are extreme examples about how you have to do the purification from the inside. The money, the better appearances, all this stuff it can just be a gloss over a mind that is still hurting mm. and still guilty. But to me, 
this is why we're sharing these examples is because a lot of times it's very easy to get lured by the symbols of this world and the passage that was in the sermon and the, the reading this morning was seek not yourself in symbols. No matter how the symbols go, even if there's witnesses around you that are going, you're doing very good, you're, you're growing, you're, you're expanding, you're very good, you've done very well, you can't really put your faith and trust even in those symbols. There was a point too with Lisa as she would go on travels with me and we would go deeper and deeper that I again I said, you know, you will let all of this go. And imagine something that seemed so important in her life that was just a, almost like a shock that this will this too will pass. And it actually came to the point where this man came into Lisa's life and he was, his specialty was selling companies. And uh, didn't your company go on the, what is NASDAQ. it? NASDAQ. NASDAQ. Her company grew so big <laughs> that it was on the NASDAQ <laughs> stock exchange. And then this man, this angel appeared and he said, I can, I can sell that company for you. And that was another trip of us going together to meet with him because he was really good at what he does and uh, basically how long did it take to sell your company? Two days. <laughs> Is that the Holy Spirit or what? Two days to sell a company that's on NASDAQ. In fact, again, that was just another little incremental step along the journey. Two days selling that, that company. But she was also in denial because her employees read about the sale, guess where? In the newspaper. Oh. <laughs> Business Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Business Monday newspaper. When we say, if you give your life over to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will work quickly. Quickly means quickly. If you are willing to learn this course, you might remember there's a part in the Course in Miracles that says, this course will be believed entirely or not at all. The Holy Spirit moves swiftly. So in two days, basically her, her employees was, were coming up to her. Well, you know, the thing was, is when, I, when he's saying this, I was just kind of saying, you know, I was actually traveling with David at the time, and, you know, I was just loving this depth and this experience of this, you know, really being able to communicate at this level and, you know, one of the gifts being around David, it's like no private thoughts, really being transparent. I could just feel my mind expanding, you know, just like really feeling like Jesus was calling me to be a miracle worker, that I just love talking about. Well, I couldn't stop talking about God. I was doing that in my company all the time. They were actually saying, you need to go do this somewhere else. <laughs> so I became an interference in the company, truly. They're like, listen, we got work to do, man. You know, And I was like, Is this? and that's actually how I did meet David, was because I went home and I was kind of like, is this all there is? You know, like I become successful and then it's like, God, is this the plan, you know, for my life? That I would just, like I had it all again, like in form, but... You know, I, I could feel that Jesus was calling me out of the world. and But it was like I was scared, too. I was terrified. And then once I started, when I did meet with David, then I could feel this new experience. That it wasn't about him. It was about this type of communication. It was, you know, we were sharing miracles and going out. And I thought, this is actually what I'm supposed to be doing. You know, and even though I was so terrified of it, so I thought... Okay, so I joined David, and then he said, you know, you're going to let go of this business. And so I thought, you know, and then this guy shows up. And, and so I just thought, I, I was just kind of teasing, like not really serious. <laughs> well, we'll see if this business will sell. Right, like, like I didn't really think that it would. You know, because I, I was kind of very comfortable in my life. You know, I seemed to have it all in form. And so when I put the business up for sale, and then it sold in two days, I was like, you are kidding me. There's no way I, I'm going to do this. Or I thought it wasn't going to actually happen. And that's why he's saying, like, because I just didn't tell anybody. David was the only one that knew. And so I didn't tell anybody. And I had 150 employees. 
And so, so uh, I was like, this isn't going to fly, actually. I just kept thinking. I was in denial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was in total denial. And, and then they, as a NASDAQ company, they have to post it to their stockholders, you know, in the paper, like, the, that they purchased this company. And, and so there it was Monday morning. I didn't know that they were going to do that. You know, Marathon Healthcare purchased Abundant Nursing. And, and like there's this merger, and so the phone just went nuts, and, and everybody's calling, and, and, and so I said, oh, listen, I was just trying something out. I said, I, I, I was not expecting that. I said, listen, that, I don't know why they're even, I didn't have nothing to sign. So I was just basically saying, oh, just ignore that. Just and ignore there's a, it's in the paper. <laughs> you sold the, country right, the company right out from under us, and it's in the paper. We find out through the paper. But the thing about it is, well, we're not even going to dwell on this one because the thing about it is, you know, there was one point too in her journey where she had gone to, I think got a reading where she was told, in this lifetime you will be a healer. A healer. You know, you see how different that is from, that's another self-concept still, but you know, that's a very surrendered self-concept. Anybody who heals, anybody who heals, you know, Jesus in the, his first 50 miracle principles, I think it's miracle principle number 23, you can heal the sick and raise the dead because you made sickness and death and can abolish them both. Mm. Tony was sharing with us, you know, he read that 24. one. 24. 24. He was saying, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good uh, direction to go in. I don't know where this is going, but that sounds pretty good. So basically, she did get a reading that she would be a healer, but we're not talking about a healer as a nurse, mm. of attending to the body and, and all the vital signs and all the things that nurses do. A lot of it's accountability and mm. record keeping documentation. and documentation and drugs and so forth. We're talking healer, like a healer in the mind. That was like almost a premonition of where her life was heading, but even when you got the reading you were thinking, that was pretty still pretty far-fetched. Mm, yeah. Like Lisa was saying, whoa, I don't know about that. That's like a healer. You know, that's pretty much. But the thing is, when, when Lisa sold her company, all it was was just another step to move in the direction of the atonement. Because anybody here who's known, if you start to have money and possessions, what can that turn into? A temptation. A huge temptation. If you end up having money, money is very liquid. You know how it is when it's sunk into mm. businesses and houses and everything, it's one thing, but when it's cold cash, you have again temptations because the ego is still in your mind going, oh now you can try out all kinds of things. You can buy things, you can do things you never could before. Money is itself is neutral. In fact, I think it's in the pamphlet, psychotherapy pamphlet, where Jesus comes out and actually says money is nothing. It's not the money that's the temptation, but as long as the ego's in your mind, and Jesus says, do not breathe life into your, your, fading, your, your fading ego. Don't breathe life into it. That's where I, I think a whole other set of temptations arose, too, mm. after the sale of, of the business. It was like that was just another step, a, a pretty radical move, but again that just, it was like a whole other wave of things. It was mm. a lot more fear mm. and darkness mm. that came up even then. Right. So that's why I'm saying we're packing all these lifetimes <laughs> into one, because we're, we're just getting going here. There's a lot more <laughs> that has come after this, but mm. these are like extreme examples that it's going against like the old Horatio Alger stories like, you know, Become, become your own boss, go from poverty into abundance, uh, achieve control of your life and everything, that's a pretty good story. That's like the American dream story and that's, that's not even the beginning because a lot of us have gone through those kind of scenarios and it's almost like pipe dreams, it's like empty, empty ghost of things where you go and you attain them. And Jesus says, there's one thing you will experience, when you have ch achieved the ego's goals, they have not satisfied you. And the ego will shift its goals into something more. Okay, you did that, now try this. 
oh good, you did that, now try this. You see, it's, it's very ingenious, it's clever, at keep shifting the goal, bigger, better, more, faster. You know, it's a very clever illusion that's trying to keep you from knowing who you are. And it keeps shifting the goal, even when you become dissatisfied, it shifts the goal again. And I think that was, there was a lot of times in your life where the goal just shifted, like, now yeah. what? Mm. But those became, there, there was like even just more darkness that had to come up. Mm. And sometimes it came up in really extreme ways. Going off to that island where you thought mm. you were going to be killed. There were like fantasies, mm. there were hidden fantasies that had yet to be played out. And it turned into some really dark times. Right. Because after the business sold, because it sold in 30 days, it was all over, and it happened really, really swift. Um, yeah, it was just kind of tripping me out, you know, I couldn't, I was like, just totally like, what's going on? And, and um, I remember going to the conference room where the attorneys were there, and, and I'd go there, and, and um, everything was signed, and I went up to leave, and, and the attorney for the Marathon Healthcare says, keys, please, the keys to the office, and it was like, oh my God, like it just like hit me, like oh my word, and then I had my staff back there, you know, because there was five people that worked in the office, you know, they're all like, you got to come back here and tell us what's going on, man, you know, because they were like all freaking out, totally freaking out, and, and I said, well, I want to go back to the office, they said, no, you're, you're finished there now, you can't go back. They said that's that's over now. Okay. It's our company, and you cannot go back. And I was like, Oh my word! What just happened here? So I actually, after that, I actually went into this massive fear, terror, you know, and went into this total darkness and really just panicked because I really felt like God was calling me out of the world, and I got like frozen in it. You know, just really kind of like, I isolated, I went back into darkness again and just like hid and, and just, yeah, and I was trying to like recreate maybe another business. Mm -hmm. Okay, well maybe I'll start another business. And every single thing, I was taking the money then and trying to invest it, because I was still afraid, I was terrified. Almost like a prophecy, the Course says, as you move toward the light, you will rush to darkness, Jesus says. The terror of the light is so strong, the terror of purpose, the terror of function, you will rush, he uses the word rush to darkness. And, and he says things like, doubt will come and go, and go to come again, yet is the ending certain. Here came, came the point, and I had gone through this myself over and over and over and over, but had come through it over and over and over and over, but still, you know, it's like we, that Abraham Lincoln, a mind changed against its will is of the same opinion still. Just because the forms may shift in our life, doesn't mean we're, we're experiencing the healing that's underneath. It's, it means we're just keeping open to moving towards that. Mm. So I think that was another time where, where there's been times where Lisa and I, we would so join so deeply in mind, and then there were times when I would shut him she, out. She wouldn't want to see, see me. I think he was a devil. <laughs> she would not. Really, I did. I did. I thought, this guy's a devil, man. He's destroying my life, and he needs to stay away from me. And, and he would call me and say, Lisa, I love you. Where are you at? And I think you, I thought, he could have just leave me alone. <laughs> you, know, I, you know, thinking he was after my money. You know, like, you know, why me? I was like from, you know, little Amish town, Pennsylvania. Why did he choose? Why was I being chosen? And just this horror that I was actually hugely projecting onto him. You know, where I was like, it was just very like, stay away from me. You, you've ruined me. The Lisa, he was ruining. We were probably, we were almost like playing out a psychic version of Star Wars. Remember with Luke Skywalker and uh, Darth Vader and everything like this. We would join together, we would have these deep joinings and then the fear would arise so much. She would think I was Darth Vader. Uh, and, and so it would, it would arise and, and the thing what happened was uh, 
There were times where I think she was she was very very concerned for her money. I never really I never really did ever see the money uh, myself because even when I, the Holy Spirit would help her to loosen from her attachment to the money and the possessions and the control and everything, and I would be like, wow, this is amazing, the Holy Spirit. She could end up being like, I call it a steward. You know, where you steward your money. There's all kinds of examples of stewarding in the Bible, where somebody lets their property, their, their money, their whatever, be used for the purposes of awakening. I was thinking Lisa was going to, she's probably going to, maybe she's going to turn out to be like a steward. As part of the plan of awakening, maybe some of her money will get used to it. Now the ego was so determined to sabotage absolutely everything that she ended up blowing it all. Blowing it all. <laughs> she, she just blew it. She just blew it. I never really saw it. She just blew, she was so afraid of me even coming close to it for God's plan that she just blew it. She would end up, didn't you buy a property? Property, property was, by the property ocean. Was, and by the ocean, lost, uh, my, every time, everything that I put it into, I'd lose it, double. Hundreds of thousands everything. of dollars. She just screwed it all. She casino. messed it up. So I was trying to get more money. <laughs> I was like, wow, this could be used for the plan of awakening for everybody. Yeah. And, Tony and I know how those donations come in. Sometimes they trickle in, sometimes they do. There it goes hundreds of thousands of dollars. Just blow it all, throw it away. Gambling, throw it away, throw it away, this and this. Now, we tell you this because it's just another chapter of the whole thing. Because then she would come through that, she would come even through that, and still, like, I'd be like, hey Lisa, where are you? I'm doing a gathering and so and so, why don't you come and join me? And when she would come and join me, she would get back, she would feel the joy of the miracle again. We would be right in it, mm. like it had never gone. But it would be like a, like a push-pull. You will, you will go to darkness, you will go to light, you will rush back to darkness. So that's the way the relationship was. But there was always these great joinings. Mm. And Hawaii came, that came much later. Yeah. <laughs> where, I think Lisa was planning to... What was it? You were going to go off and she had a, a boyfriend. Mm. And uh, I said, I don't, th this doesn't sound good to me. <laughs> and she's thinking, who is he to tell me? Who, I'm just like with Helen Shuggie, I would just kind of let it come. Who, who is he to tell me who I'm going to be in relationship with? And again, there's nothing special, there's nothing this and this, but, but it just kind of turned in to a well, nightmare. An, an absolute, <laughs> there was one time when you went to that island and you thought you were being chased mm. and going to be murdered and killed through one of those fantasies. <laughs> this one, it just turned into an absolute nightmare. Mm. Paranoia, fear, mm. desperation. Mm. It, this was after quite a few years, too. I don't yeah. know. This was after years of our relationship. She went spiraling down into that where Instead of having all this a company and all this money and everything, remember she went from pregnant and and barefoot and food stamps to married a millionaire, then that whole thing, uh, then the big company, and then that whole thing was gone, and then you spiraled down into fear and debt. You mm. went into mm. debt. Then she started spiraling into debt. You see how the patterns are there. It doesn't. You have to go off the surface of things, you have to get down to the root of the fear and the, the desperation. And after all of that, it was just that. And yet, the Holy Spirit was there all through that. Mm. We, I remember one point we met at a restaurant or whatever, and then there it was again. Joining, forget the desperation, forget this, forget how dark it had got, or whatever, but there was something inside that mm. was just crying out and saying, I want to heal. Mm. That was a really deep call, I really want to heal. And so again, the Holy Spirit again comes swooping in there, Christ comes in there, and the joining of that, you went I think to the Peace House for a while, and it was mm. like, this was like deep healing. Very deep. Because there's like layers of... Humbling. And this journey is very, very humbling because just the layers and layers, you know, and it, it is really like an onion. It's not just like you're going to, I mean, some people have that experience, but for me, it was layer after layer of 
of, of shame and guilt and unworthiness and hate, self-hatred. The self-hatred that was so deep, that was down underneath all of that. And it was like, I felt like the journey was just taking me, seeing like, you know, in the money and into the darkness or whatever. But it was really just showing me what was really going on in my mind. And it was, it was that was, when I was in Hawaii, I feel like it, it was funny because I was in Hawaii and um, we live right down the street from a volcano. <gasps> And, and a live volcano. A live volcano that was gushing uh, lava, and it was funny because all this, all this deep, dark stuff that was coming, that you know, like almost like these layers preparing you for the next step. You know, it's like nothing's going to be thrust upon you. So I felt like I was just being, you know, my mind was ready to go to that. You know, actually, the fear of God was what I felt that I was facing at that point, like really honestly facing the fear of God. You know, where you just feel like you're completely, completely helpless, or something like, yeah. And I was very angry at God at that time. Uh, that actually was a real crucial point for me, because at that time, I actually questioned, and I didn't until that time, that I actually, after all the years of studying the Course, you know, because I became so, went through this major mass of darkness after devoting, feeling like I devoted my life, uh, devoted everything, that I actually started not to believe in God anymore. And I started not to even trust the Course, not to trust you, like yeah. very deeply, actually. And that was when real hopelessness came in. You know, because then it was like, okay, now what, what do I do here in this situation? Yeah, really alone. Or it's like, okay, there's not even God, or I don't believe in any of it anymore. Which was really beautiful, too, actually. Yeah. And then after this, this dive, again, spending $10,000, $20,000, $30,000, $40,000 in debt and going again into one of those dark spirals. You know, like Snoopy and the Red Baron, where the, the plane mm -hmm. goes into the death spiral and just starts spiraling and smoking and heading for the ground. That's a, we've seen this many other times and there she goes again, just going down. After all of that, down towards the crash, it was like, what happens was through the power of our joining, the power of God and the power of our joining, she, she pulled out of the tailspin before the plane <laughs> crashed and then we joined and joined and joined and joined on purpose and function. Mm. Like, you need to come back to your function. You have a very, very important function that that's why you are here for. That's what it's all for. We joined yet again on that, and we joined in that function, and then and up she comes. She comes <laughs> spinning out, out of the, that, and she, she goes to Mexico. Mm. And she's in Mexico, and she's working with all of these people, beloveds, and she's building, she's got mighty, mighty companions, JP, mm. and the, the, around her, and she just starts to get more into function, more into function, deeper into function, deeper. I mean, so much so that there was a woman who, whose husband down in Mexico had thrown himself, a Course in Miracles uh, student, her hus husband had thrown himself off a building and committed suicide. And I was out that day, I happened to be in Mexico, but I was out, and they come to the gate of the door, and they, it was on Easter, it was on Easter and they come in, and it's, this one's for Lisa, part of her, <laughs> Jesus is helping her get soaring again in her healing function, which is her whole point for coming here, and basically the children, the, was it two daughters, and, and some people. It was three daughters. Three daughters, the mother, and then a group of people mm. that were with her, and they come, and then the mother and the daughters come to Lisa, and then all this healing pours through her mm. with this, this man who's just, his husband had just committed suicide. In fact, so much so that the mother immediately felt lifted up just being with, in the presence of Lisa. I wasn't even there, I was guided somewhere else, but I came back. And it was so healing to hear the story about how they actually, the spirits, the mm. state of mind was completely lifted up, lifted up because mm. the woman had been there to our center before mm. and she knew the power and the love that was there. But that was like an example. So again, here she goes again, 
lifting herself up towards her calling, towards the atonement, towards her true purpose in life. And so that continued and continued on to the point where it's like she'd been, you'd been in Mexico for so long at that point, was it over a year? A year. A year, that it was like it's time to go back to the United States. And even though she came with her plane, she was up and soaring and she was going up again, she still had like, was it about 40? 40,000. 40, debt. It was like a cloud <laughs> over the plane, like, they go going, don't think you're out of my grasp yet. <laughs> I've got $40,000 of debt hanging over you, you know. You're not out yet. So, again we meet and join and everything, and I said, no, you're supposed to go to the United States and, and Lisa's like, but what about, the, that's where the cloud was still there, what about the debt and everything? And I said, Jesus will handle that debt. You just give that debt to Jesus. After all that she's been through, you've just pulled out of it. Now you're getting so close back to Jesus again, this love affair with Jesus. Jesus will handle that 40,000 debt. Did she come back to the United States and work to pay off the debt? No. No. Uh, did she find a tree with $40,000 uh, growing on the tree? No. no. Two was it was it diamond rings coming back? No, no. Basically, I just said Jesus will handle the debt. How long from the time that you got landed back in the United States did it take Jesus, without working, without receiving any gifts, without receiving any support in any way? How long did it take Jesus to handle a forty thousand dollar debt when you're on purpose? A week. <laughs> One week, Jesus is like, boom, the cloud, the ego, boo, 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 boom, he takes it away. That's the power of Christ. If you give your life over to Christ, to do Christ's work, anything can be, the Holy Spirit moves swiftly, just as we heard in the story, swiftly, swiftly, swiftly. And it was, again, just miraculous. Lisa would tell me, I found, look at this, she would like report to me how it was happening, but I wasn't surprised by mm -hmm. any of that, because I really felt, I really felt that Jesus <coughs> would take that away. And so, How and, did it happen? I filed, yeah. I filed bankruptcy. She oh. filed bankruptcy. And then everything that she needed for that, just drop, 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 shows you Jesus can use anything. <laughs> There was no diamond rings involved, there was no parachutes and, and gifts, it was, but it was quite amazing. Mm. And all the way down to the point where the bankrupt lawyer said you can't have uh, money in your account. Mm. And so in the end she had to try to find ways, because she had a little bit of money you left in her account. Actually I was living on GoFundMe for a while. I was putting out a GoFundMe thing, and so people were giving me money, and so I had like, well, I didn't have enough to pay off the debt. I only got so much, so I could make the payments on the, the debt, but I couldn't pay it off. Mm -hmm. Because I tried to get a couple of jobs, and, and uh, yeah, my skills were gone, you know. I you tried to go back to the old ways. Yeah, I, I couldn't do anything. Couldn't do anything anymore. It was like I got fired twice. You know, in the last job, I, I ended up quitting because I actually couldn't do anymore. But it was just like, it was like I had no power anymore. Like, my arms and my, like, I couldn't work. I couldn't do things that weren't in function, actually, that weren't part of doing what God's will was for my life. And I was fighting that, trying to use my, it was like I was, I couldn't do it. It was the weirdest thing. One job, she was surrounded by a psychologist. Oh, you know, right. the model, the psychological model, and she'd come so far with the course through all that, outgrowing a lot of that, and then almost trying to go back and fit herself into, you know, you can't put new wine into old no. wineskins. She was trying to do that. So that was another great lesson, that you, you can't put new wine into old wineskins. Mm -hmm. That some of those old mechanisms that used to work so well weren't working at all. And we've, had, we've all had those experiences where we, Hey, it worked before. What? It's just what's going on. What's? This is crazy. The ego will tell you you're doing something wrong, but actually, you you can't put your energy and your devotion where it's not supposed to be. So, 
needless to say, we, sh we shared just some of those examples to say that, that, you know, what Lisa's been working on for the last, how many weeks is it with the, the Mystery School? Mm. The, Probably like eight weeks. About eight weeks. The mm. last eight weeks, this whole idea of Mystery Schools has come in, you know, the ancient Mystery Schools. Mm. And it's just, again, the Spirit is swirling as soon as... Not only does the Holy Spirit handle everything in your perception, but it's also, it's got a very deep plan of, of, for the whole awakening for, for everything and everyone. And that's been amazing too, because it, you found your glee again. You hit your glee yeah. mark again. Yeah, I really love it actually, because I feel like truly, uh, you know, just over these years for me, I just feel like my life has been a mystery. I've been living in the unknown. And, and really, in this total like exploration of my own mind, that's what it feels like. And, and just, you know, the beginning phases, I must say, I was very scared. Uh, but then there, there came a point where I just really let go. You know, and I said, okay, God, I don't know what's going on, but I'm just going to keep going. And, you know, I got nothing left to lose. Actually, when you got nothing left to lose, you just say, I'm just going to keep going. And I'm going to see where God would have me go. But, and, and so I just actually, and, and just me and David, whenever seemingly, this is, our, this is our, my assignment, has been with David and the community and, and working with others. I love it. I'm, I'm in love with it. And there's just been a lot, a lot of healing. And now this last time, this joining has been so deep because, you know, I've kind of, like the last two years, just really just like each day, okay, what am I doing today, God? What's, what's going to look like today? And, and within the community, it's been really beautiful because that's how we're, we're doing our daily life. Like, okay, let's, let's start again today. Like not to create any rituals, not to create anything, and really go into prayer and say, how are we going to do this day? And So it, it, just this whole idea of a mystery school came in. You know, that well, the people that were there said, this is really like a mystery school. You know, we're just really, really opening up to see what the Holy Spirit, you know, will give for us this day. And I just share with you, because just this idea, and then David, I mean, just joined, it felt just really explosive, and it felt alive, and we were like, oh my God, this is a, this is a unbelievable, it's a God idea, that's what it felt like, you can feel it, there's energy, and it's like, oh my God. And then, it was really beautiful, because uh, everybody had left and went up to the monastery, and I was in, uh, we have a metaphysical center there, and and I was sitting there, and I was just like totally not knowing how to do this or what to do, and just really empty and saying, God, you show me the way. And, and I'm sitting there in, in such deep prayer, and there's these books up there. And all of a sudden, I looked up, and I, I just love this because it's so precious to me that there was this book uh, up there called the Tabula Rasa. It's just a little, it's in this folder. It's called the Tabula Rasa. And, and uh, it says the pristine mind on it. And, and the beautiful thing was, is this was the very first thing that David gave to me like 15 years ago when I first met him. Uh, when I first met him, he didn't have, there was only two videos, you know, and he actually only had this one writing. I mean, he had others, but I mean, the only thing that he could hand out at a gathering. And he gave it to me at the very first gathering. And I remember in the very beginning, my childlike glee and, you know, just like, it was like really this mystical mind, this mysticism and this love affair with God, that it was possible to not take any thought for tomorrow, and that this happiness and this glee was the natural state of the mystic. And, and, and I, I, I couldn't believe it. I, I pulled it off the shelf and I started reading it. And yeah, I just feel very grateful. Yeah. That's what my joining with David and all these undoings was, was to really, not just to talk about that, but to come into a living experience of that. That was my hope, that, that trusting the Holy Spirit. And while I was sitting there that day, I could truly say that that was what my experience is. My experience is this, into this vast, um, pure, childlike, you know, unknownness. Of these blocks really do go away, and that I was there. And so 
actually we've named the school Tablo Rasa Mystery School. And and so it's She's it's, the director. <laughs> she's come through all that now. She's the director of the Tabula Rasa Mystery School. Now. These are symbols, remember. As learning goes along, you will make many self concepts. You know all this is is the spirit coming up with concepts. But they get more lighter, more expansive, more into the, the oneness, into that experience of it. And and that's but the best part of it all is not the title, it's not the school, mm. but to see her happy, mm. gleeful, like a little kid and joyful, racing out of her room. David, oh my God, did you see this thing I saw on the internet? You know, it's like discovering <laughs> videos, mm. images, doing well, no, things. You know what I everything. love? I love this, you know, there's this most beautiful thing. I love the experience of the Holy Spirit doing everything through me. Mm. That I can truly step back and let Him lead the way. There's an experience in that, and I'm not the doer. It's where my thoughts ha have been removed, that the obstacles for this spirit-driven thing, like, and to watch, you know, what the Lord will do, you know, that it's not me that's doing these things, but my Father in Heaven. Those are, that's an experience, that's a direct experience, and I find it utterly fascinating because I feel like that's really what the Mystery School is about. Even the whole idea came in just in an instant, and then it kind of got bigger. It's like, you know, feeling like it's an idea from God. It's not my idea. It's, it's, it's an idea that keeps growing. It's expanding, and it's, 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 it is a mystery. It's like I feel like it's all about a self-discovery. I feel like I'm discovering who I am. It's such a beautiful, discovering falling in love with myself. You know, and, and, and really extending that love to everyone. That that isn't just some fantasy, but that is who I am, and that that's who we all are. And like that mystery of that, I feel like that love just keeps expanding. Uh, my own awareness of that, it, who I am, is just expanding, like vastly, actually. But it's not about Lisa. It's not about any of this. It's about this affair with God or whatever, you know, who I am, and, and then watching in prayer and say, show me and tell me, and, and really knowing that I do not need to know. That's not just, actually, I can't know anything. That's what I really, if I know anything, is I do not know. You know, uh, that's true, that I do not know where I'm going, I don't know who I am, and that God is going to continually open up these new horizons of yeah, of newness and freshness and aliveness, you know, to, to truly come to the place of awareness that I am beginning again, really, every day, as a child, to come into this defenselessness and an experience where the Spirit truly, truly doeth this. And so then I watch it, and it's funny with this, so it's just we have this new, like, beautiful uh, backdrop as the mystery school. <laughs> And it's been so fun, actually, to watch it unfold. And it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. And because it is just blooming. And, and one of the things that's been be beautiful about it, it has enlivened our whole community around the world. Everybody's saying they want to... A lot of people are participating. Oh, everybody's participating. They're like, oh, I want to be part. I want to be part of it. It's not even about some school in the future. The first class is going to be in May 2017, but it's not about that. It's about this present moment that we get to, you know, I am the mystery school. You know, that, 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 to live in this unknownness and to be carried like a child. And then us coming together in collaboration. One of the things that I have uh, been given the gift of is to be with David on this journey. And one of the greatest gifts has been collaboration, that, that, that we work on projects. And we really come together like it's just a backdrop, really just for us to be together and have the spirit join together, you know, to work through us, to extend this love and to extend this gift of forgiveness and extend, just extending, extending, expanding. I mean, the mind of God expands forever and we're part of that experience. I mean, that's a living experience. You know, when we're caught up and contracted in this fear and you're bound up, you're bound up, it's like a flower, We're, it's not natural. Our natural state is to be opening, like truly, truly opening and expanding. And that's not just one time, it's an eternal experience. So that's what I see, it's like 
we're removing these boxes, the mind can continue just to open up. Open-mindedness is the last characteristic of a teacher of God. And I've experienced for my own self is now that seemingly, and I'm right here, my mind is open to hear, you know, the open-mindedness. And hearing this, whatever the spirit is wanting to do through me, for me, just to be in this, you know, extension. And that's for all of us. You know, it's like, it's all of our birthright. It's all of our natural state. So I think we're getting close to our break time, but the key from everything that we've talked about, the key lesson from all this is, is just to see from all that we've shared, the, the, all you need is the willingness to let the Holy Spirit do this, handle this, exchange the self-concepts. You will go through many different self-concepts as learning goes along. You know, for example, if you're identified as being a mother, mm. you, there, there's ways in which that concept can be expanded. I would say you would go from mother to feeling more and more like Divine Mother. Mm. You know, you've seen those throughout history, the Divine Mother, the Divine Feminine. You, you move in that direction. If you're a minister, like, like Tony, that self-concept, let that ex minister concept to keep expanding. That's, mm. And that's what Tony is a good example of that. There's always the new, there's something else coming in, there's something else, there's more collaborations, there's more joinings, you know. And even there are people that have been CEOs like Lisa and they start opening more, you know, to, to being the dreamer of the dream, mm -hmm. you know, to go from CEO, to go from uh, a very open-hearted, loving politician to keep opening and expanding towards the dreamer of the dream. If the only way Jesus tells us that we can reach the happy dream is from the experience of being the dreamer, he says, then you can let a new purpose be given to the dream. But as long as you keep being identified with the human being, the person, as long as you're a figure in somebody else's dream, you still are going to play the victim. You're still going to be at mer the mercy of the dream or at the mercy of other seeming dream figures. As long as you cling to being a dream figure, you will still have these very difficult lessons because you aren't. You can't be a dream figure and the dreamer. It's one or the other. You can't be a body and a mind. You are a mind, he says, holy mind, purely mind. So. The value of what we've been sharing, hopefully in a very practical way with these kind of very extreme examples, is how empowering it is to stay open to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Because the guidance of the Holy Spirit was, was there through all of these parables. You know, it was there, keep coming to me, keep opening, keep trusting. Don't get so caught up in the outcomes, because if you heard these parables, you know, you would say, Oh, that's really good. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Whoops, too bad. <laughs> you know, you, it's almost like sounds of those Eastern stories where, you know, so-and-so, he's at work, he works in the, the farm, and then he gets drafted into the war, and then, he, you know, this happens, and, and the wise one just says, we shall see. Mm. Like, we shall see. We shall come to a higher vision through all of these seeming ups and downs, we don't even have to be, to follow all the ups and downs. We can, we can have that faith and trust that no matter what is occurring, it's occurring for our good. In fact, there's a workbook lesson. That one of the things that I like about the workbook, there's, in the course, there's actually a line that says, what happens is what I desire, and what does not occur is what I do not want to happen. <laughs> wow! That's, you know, that's like, he says, even in this world it is I that rule my destiny. Myself is ruler of the universe. That's the lesson. What happens is what I desire. What does, what does not occur is what I do not want to happen. You feel how powerful that is. It reminds me of Lesson 152, you know, it, it, it's bringing, the power of decision is my own. He's saying everything that's that seems to occur is the result of your decision. 
Jesus comes in right away and says, you may believe this is too all-encompassing to be the truth, but truth has no exceptions. What do you think our theme is for the next uh, conference coming up in 2018, right behind David's head there? Love makes no exceptions. That's where the power is. That's what ignites our mind. That's what takes us flying, soaring up into heights of happiness when we don't make exceptions, when we don't try to compromise with the Holy Spirit and say, well, I don't know. My past learning, you know, is still, <laughs> you know, but that's where we try to compromise. When we give over our past learning and we say, I do not know my own best interest, but you do, and you show me, then that ignites the, the awakening. So I think we've, we've reached the break, and then <laughs> uh, what we'll do after the break, there's coffee, and I don't know if there's a little cake left, and a few, no, no. cake left, <laughs> cake's gone. <laughs> but we'll, we'll come back, if, maybe 15, 20 minutes, something like that, we'll come back, and then we'll open it up. This will be our laboratory then. <laughs> as we come back that second half. Mm -hmm. I mean, just a couple of notes, okay. For those of you who weren't here for the Sunday uh, service, we have all of David's books here, and we would be happy to sell them to you, and they're all discounted over their regular price. And we have his brand new one, which is a compilation of sayings of Jesus from the Bible, and sayings of Jesus, of course, from A Course of Miracles, and showing how similar they are in places. And this is just a, a great inspirational book, and it's also, as I said, it's Sunday. This is a great one to give people who don't know a lot about A Course in Miracles, to introduce them, and to show them just the high spiritual thoughts that are contained in it, and how alike they are to some of the high spiritual thoughts of the Bible. So this normally sells for uh, about 20, but we're selling it here today for 14. Would you just read a few questions out of the, the front, the table of contents at the very, very beginning? Because that's what Jesus did. He said, I'll give you the questions, then I'll give you the answers from the Bible and from the Course, which if you get to know them all, you can, this is the Judeo-Christian culture, you can go around, it helps you speak to whoever you meet in the language that people okay, can understand. some of these chapters, I guess you would call them, What is Temptation? Speak on perfect equality. What does it mean to be still? Speak on the resurrection. How will the world end? Speak on prayer. How would you like me to look upon the body? Anyway, things of that, that nature. That nature, yeah. yeah. So. Also, maybe, uh, I think there might be a couple of you who didn't get a chance because it was busy to talk to Reverend Kelly about making a contribution for this workshop. She is there, so go and talk to her now. Uh, and... and Buy some books. And have a coffee. Okay. okay. Maybe about 20 minutes, we'll reconvene. If we could just move these chairs right here.